Okay, good, perfect. Okay, let's get started. Uh, serverless and PHP, I guess this is pretty obvious. Um, I will just add that I've been playing with serverless um, for a year and a half. And so this talk is about sharing what I've learned and uh, what I've done with uh, Amazon Lambda and serverless in general. So yeah, um, this talk is about serverless. If you do not know what serverless means, that's fine. We'll cover that. Uh, the idea is to start very wide, see what serverless means, and then progressively move towards PHP. So um, the way I like to uh, explain serverless is to start with how we run uh, our applications today, right? And we run them using resources, like servers, like disk storage. We think with resources. We pay for them, we rent them, and we then configure our applications to run on those resources. And so the move to serverless is to move from resources to services. Um, you see, with a service, the job gets done, and we don't really care how. I mean, the job just gets done. So let's see a few examples to see what I mean. We have, for example, storage as a service. Um, Amazon S3 is, I think, a very good example of a serverless, uh, the service equivalent to running a disk, uh, renting a disk, and and uh, storing files on there. With um, uh, Amazon S3, just pay and, and send the files to the API, and that's it. You have database as a service, caching as a service, authentication as a service, search as a service. We have so many services. It's, it's like the era of services, right? Right. And um, why? Why are we doing that? I, thi I think there are three main um, advantages to moving to serverless. First, we have a lower operational effort. So it's easier. We have less things to configure, less things to manage when uh, moving to a service. Uh, this is because simply it's now Amazon or Microsoft or Google's job to make sure that the service runs and we, we only have to use the service. Um, the second um, advantage is scalability. So uh, what I mean by that is that um, let's take Amazon S3 again, for example. Um, if you pay for a resource, uh, like a disk, and um, y you eventually run out of space. So you have to scale manually and, and buy a second disk and, and etc. With Amazon S3, you don't have any limits. Amazon is doing the scaling for you. So um, you, you don't have any limits, and if you are starting to like hit the limits of Amazon, it's either that you're doing something really great or something really bad. Right. Uh, Amazon is usually better than me or maybe all of us at scaling things. And finally, the advantage we often hear about with serverless is uh, the cost. We can save money by moving to serverless. Um, this isn't always the case, of course, but the ID, and it's really important, the ID behind um, serverless and the services is that we only pay for what we use. Again, with S3, if we rent a disk, we will pay for that disk every month, whether you, we use 10 megabytes or 200 gigabytes, right? With Amazon S3, we only pay for the files we actually send to Amazon. So sometimes we can save a lot of money. Um, but I guess what's more interesting, the, the thing as, a devel as developers that interests us the most, is uh, function as a service. This is, um, we could call that execution as a service. It's basically the service where you send your code to uh, Amazon or Google or Microsoft again, and they run the code for you. So how does it work? Uh, what does it mean running the application? Well, let's take a web application. How does a web application run? It looks like this. You have an HTTP request. It's like the, the, the green arrow that comes in. And we have the blue bar. It's the code that gets executed to handle the request. The code will return a response and do whatever. But in reality, it doesn't really work like that. It works like this. You have the blue bar. It's the, it's the code that runs all the time. It's the web server. And it's running all the time, and it's waiting for requests. And when a request comes in, it will execute the correct code to execute, like the, the controller or the handler or whatever. So moving to serverless means moving from that to that. We are getting rid 
of the server, we are getting rid of anything that waits, poles, uh, like demons. We get rid of that, and it's now the, provider, the, the hosting provider's job to run that. We focus on writing the code or the function that gets executed when a request comes in. This is why it's called function as a service. There are two key differences that we need to understand here. The first one is that the code is executed on events. So um, we don't there in serverless, there is no waiting for something. There is no daemon. There is no uh, long running processes. We have to think with events. Events can be HTTP requests. Uh, events can be um, messages in message queues. Or they can even be crowned, like uh, every day at midnight, this is an event, and it will trigger some code. So it's not just HTTP. And the second uh, big difference is that this is stateless. And this is really important. So let's go back uh, to that a few moments. What really happens here? So what happens um, when the request comes in? Uh, I will say Amazon, but whatever the service is, Amazon will uh, boot a container, a Linux container. So this is not Docker, but this is very similar. It will boot a container and boot our code inside of it, and the code will get executed, handle the HTTP request, and then stop. Everything will stop. So the next time an HTTP request comes in, the whole thing runs again. There is no shared memory, there is no shared state between the executions. This is why it's stateless. Now, let's forget about PHP for a moment. Uh, you see with Java and Go and Node and Python applications, this is a huge change because those applications, when you run them on the server, they start. And the first thing they do usually, they, they start listening on the port 80. There's the web server inside the applications. So for those languages, for those applications, this is a huge change. But in PHP, this is a bit fun because that's how we run applications today, right? We have Nginx or Apache as the web server, but our PHP process only gets executed for a request, and then everything gets thrown away. This is, this is really interesting, because it means that with PHP, we have a head start for serverless applications. PHP is perfect for function as a service. Um, unfortunately, PHP is not very well supported, on those providers, this is, uh, this is a bit ironic, this is a bit of a shame, but that's fine, that, that will not stop us. Um, let's go back over the three advantages of serverless in general and see how they fit with uh, function as a service. The first one, uh, the operational effort. It's supposed to be easier to run our code on function as a service. Um, to, to show you, um, so yeah, basically, it's, uh, you just push code to Amazon, and they can take care of the OS, they take care of uh, configuring everything so that it scales. They take care of a lot of, lot of stuff that's, uh, that's uh, obvious. Let, I, I just want to show you how to create uh, what they call a Lambda or a function on Amazon, and show you how simple it is. This is a screenshot of um, Amazon, uh, uh, the Amazon console. You have... Um, yeah, I hope you can see right. You have uh, first you upload a zip containing your code. So while a zip while a zip file, that that's fine. We have other options. But anyway, you push your code. You choose the runtime. So this can be Node.js. This can be um, Go, Python, and, and C Sharp and Java. There is no PHP. Anyway, you choose the runtime and you define the handler. So the handler is actually really simple. It's the file name dot the function name. So here, the code that will get executed is the handle function in the handler.js file, because this is a JavaScript uh, lambda. And the code looks like this. So I have a Python and JavaScript example. And you know, as I said, it's a function. It's pretty simple. Um, you have, uh, uh, as a parameter, you have the event. So this is a variable, like an object or an array which represents the event that triggered the Lambda. So if it's an HTTP request, well, in there you will have the headers, the URL, the, the, the body of the request. If it's a message in the message queue, you will have the message. Uh, if it's a cron, I'm not really sure what's in there. And you can return a response. Uh, if it's an HTTP response, obviously, you can return anything because you can call a Lambda, you can invoke a Lambda manually. 
And sometimes you don't need to return a response, for example, with crons. With JavaScript, you can see that it's uh, a, a little bit different because there's a callback, you know, it's JavaScript, but it works basically the same. So, what about scalability? So as you can see, it's pretty simple to just deploy a Lambda in production, and it just works. What about scalability? Why is it more scalable, supposedly? Well, uh, let's get back to that. Here you have one HTTP request, you have one execution. If you have no HTTP request, there is nothing that gets executed. But what happens if there's 1,000 HTTP requests at the same time, the same millisecond? Well, this happens. Your code will be instantiated and run in 1,000 containers, 1,000 times, and each piece of code, each instance, will handle exactly one request or one event. It could even be in separate data centers. Um, the key thing here, again, is that it's stateless. There is no interaction or interference between the executions. It's really easy to scale because one or 1,000 is the same thing. The only thing that's different is that we use more Amazon servers, and I guess we are kind of limited by um, how many servers Amazon has, but I guess it's okay, because we're fine. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that, let's say, those 1,000 PHP processes hit the same database at the, the same time, right? You will have a bottleneck, obviously. So this is not magic. Um, what you will want to do if you expect a huge load, traffic spikes, so this is not always the case, but if you do, you may want to build your application serverless from end to end. So serverless before, if you have load balancers or stuff like that, uh, serverless after, uh, serverless databases, for example, or things that can scale at the same rate as your PHP applications. And what about costs? Why is it supposedly cheaper? So let's take this graph. Um, this is a web application in production. Um, and you can see that uh, this is like the number of requests per hours. You can see that during the night, there is not so much traffic. Then you have a bit of traffic at 8 a.m. Then it, it goes down, quits down. And at 9 p.m., this is where you get the most traffic. So what you will do with resources, with servers, you will um, pay for a server that can handle the traffic spike at 9 p.m., right? Or maybe twice that or three times that, if you're careful. So what you will pay for is basically something that, you know, like this blue box. You will pay for something that is fixed all, all, uh, all day long. At 9 p.m., this is perfect. You're paying exactly wha what you need. But the rest of the day, you, have, you are paying for a much uh, too powerful server. Um, with the serverless approach, with function as a service, you will pay for something that is proportional to the green area here. You will pay only for what you use. How does it, does it work? Um, you pay uh, for the 100 milliseconds of execution time uh, of your code. So if you have a request comes in and your code gets executed for 300 milliseconds and return a response, you will pay for 300 milliseconds. And that uh, scale to the number of e executions you have. So it's really, really fine um, uh, pricing. So you pay for something like the, gr the green area. So let's push this um, theoretically uh, ID further. Um, if you pay servers, you will pay for something proportional to the green area plus the blue area, right? You pay for the whole thing. So what I am, where am I going with this? Um, the more blue you have, in your graph for your application, the more you are paying for resources you don't use. The more blue you have, the more money you are wasting. The more blue you have, the more you can save by moving to serverless. So it depends on your application, obviously. The execution time on Lambda is more expensive per, per second than the one on EC2 on the one or, or, of a server, obviously, because you have a higher level of service. But in many, many cases, you have a lot of blue, basically. So you can actually save money. 
There are also, this is a web application, but there are other kind of applications. Let's take a patch process or a crowns, workers, uh, um, stuff like that. If they are important, you can put them on their own server, and then you have a lot of blue. So for those cases, this is really, really great, and you can save a lot. So function as a service, you can find it as Amazon Lambda on uh, AWS. You can find it as IBM OpenWhisk. This is interesting because this uh, provider um, uses Docker containers. So you can use anything. You can run PHP on OpenWhisk. Microsoft Azure Functions um, runs PHP, has PHP support at least. The last time I tried, but it was one year ago, so I'll be honest, I don't know if it's been better, but I didn't get it to run PHP actually, and the docs were terrible. Maybe it's gotten better, give it a try. And you have Google Cloud Functions, which doesn't support PHP. Amazon Lambda doesn't support PHP either. If you are curious, if you want to try it, definitely go with Amazon Lambda. This is the most stable one and um, yeah, really reliable. So yeah, what about PHP? Finally, we get to PHP here. Um, how do we do? This, this is where it gets fun. Um, what I'm ab about to tell you is, um, is actually, uh, I'm not the first one doing that. There are uh, some open source projects on GitHub that do that. Uh, even Amazon has documented that, how to run PHP on Lambda. Well, you see, with uh, Lambda, this is a, a Linux container. This is not Docker. We can't use any kind of Docker files, but this is a Linux container. So we can grab a PHP binary or compile it and grab our PHP script and push that in the Lambda and have a Go or a Python or a Node script that will just run our PHP file. And that works. That just works. Um, it turns out the, the one with the best performances at least from what I've tried for now, it's uh, not JS, so I have a JavaScript file, and it just works. Um, the thing to understand here is that we are not like reprogramming a reverse proxy or PHP FPM or Nginx in JavaScript. Uh, it's really simple because there is only one request at a time. So it's like 40 lines of JavaScript to make that run. You don't have issues with load or concurrency. It's really simple. And it's really reliable. As long as it works once, it will work all the time. So um, with that, we can run PHP on Lambda. But it's really impractical, because you have to write the JavaScript file, and then you have to compile PHP or find it online and, and deploy all of that. With the zip file, remember, this sucks. So this is why I started an open source project called Bref. Bref is on GitHub. And with bref, with a single line of, uh, uh, with a single command, bref deploy, uh, it will take your PHP file, download PHP, the PHP binary, write the JavaScript um, uh, handler, and push all that to Amazon Lambda. So you don't have to do anything to run PHP. And you can run, uh, you can write a PHP Lambda just like with any other language. You have an anonymous function, and you have the event here, which is an array, and you can return a response. Bref takes care of everything. Um, maybe you're kind of wondering what this is. This is the lambda sign. This is just for fun. Uh, this is an alias function. Don't worry. It, if you don't want to use it, that's fine. Um, this is just shorter, so it's better in the slides. So this is Bref, and Bref doesn't stop here. Bref has three goals. The first one, obviously, is PHP support. Um, but maybe eventually it will land in Amazon Lambda, so that's fine. We'll be, I'll be really happy today that it... Uh, it uh, it does. The second goal is deployment, because remember the zip file. This is this is. I mean, this is really not good. Um, so you, you just run bref deploy, and it's online. Bref internally uses a framework called or the tool called the serverless framework, which is not official at all, but it it, re it works really fine, and it's um, there's a big community behind that, so it's really easy to deploy lambdas with that. It adds on top of that um, choosing your PHP version installing the extensions you want, and configuring php.ini, installing composer dependencies, and you know the classic stuff when you want to deploy PHP. And finally, and I think that's the most important part, um, Bref has another goal. You see, I told you PHP is perfect for function as a service. This is huge. It means that Laravel, and Symfony, and any PSR 15, PSR 7 framework 
can run on Amazon Lambda. And often it's really little changes that we have to do. Sometimes it's we don't have to do to change anything. So we developers, we have we are used to our framework. Uh, we don't have to learn it anything again. We don't have to go back to this and wonder, OK, that's great, but what do I do now? You can keep using Symfony and Laravel and whatever and deploy on Amazon Lambda. This isn't magic. This isn't all perfect yet. Sometimes you have to change like how the logs are written, how I think, uh, you know. But uh, with time in time, we can make it a really seamless experience. Right now, honestly, it's pretty easy. Uh, I want to show you just uh, the Symfony example. So this is the index.php of Symfony, basically. You have you create the Symfony kernel, and this commented part is uh, the classic Symfony stuff. So we remove all that, like create the request and, and have the kernel handle the request and return the response. We get rid of that because there is no HTTP request at, uh, like PHP anymore. What we do is create Bref and we pass in the kernel, the Symfony kernel, to Bref, and that's it. What Bref will do is it will take the event, it will because the event represents the HTTP request, and it will turn that event into a Symfony request. It's really really easy to do. It's just converting from an array to uh, an object. And then it will call the kernel, pass it the request, and the kernel, the Symfony will not see any difference. This is where it's great. It doesn't change anything. Symfony returns the response, so your controller gets called and everything. That's great. And then Bref returns the response to Amazon. And that's it. Um, I just want to show you also a really small tool. I, I love that tool. It's the, um, for the Symfony console. You have bin console and your command. You can keep the same thing and replace it, replace it with Bref CLI. Bref CLI basically takes the command and run it in a lambda. So if you want to play with it, you know, just try a few commands, uh, long, uh, very complex stuff. You can run it in a lambda very easily. It's also very useful for uh, doctrine migrations and stuff like that that you want to run in production or in staging or whatever because there is no SSH access. There is no server running, there is no SSH. So this is pretty useful for maintenance and stuff. OK, so let's get back to this. I guess um, as soon as I said that PHP was executed by JavaScript, you were over. What? Performances? Is there any overhead? Yes, there is. There is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So how much? Um, what I did is I compared a, a node, a Lambda, JavaScript Lambda, which doesn't do anything, it should run in zero millisecond, and a PHP Lambda, which runs with node, which should also take zero millisecond. And this is what we get. So this isn't really good, right? 300 milliseconds of runtime for PHP. The good news is that we can choose, um, you know, we can customize the amount of memory available for PHP, or for the Lambda. And the more uh, RAM we have, the more powerful the CPU is. So when we increase the Lambda, we get decent performances. We get between 20 and 25 milliseconds of overhead. So if you have a, a, an HTTP request that takes 100 milliseconds, with Amazon Lambda, it will take 120 milliseconds. So for some applications, like if your applications takes 5 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds to, uh, to respond, this is not good. This, this will not work, so that's fine. You can forget about it. You can, you can leave if, if you want to. That's fine. But my conclusion is that for maybe 80% of all the applications out there in the world, which is pretty huge, this is fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, zero point something. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's really, really, really like zero. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is great. We can run PHP on there. We just have to accept, you know, the fact that it will run a bit slower. What we have to consider too is that we lose 20 milliseconds, but we gain a lot of scalability. This can be a trade-off that you can choose. You also gain, of course, the operational effort and stuff like that, but also you gain stable response times, and that, that's important. Um, you, you know, sometimes you, you make a great application, you are really proud, One, 100 milliseconds response time or 50 milliseconds response time. You put it in production and it runs fine. And then there's a huge traffic spike and everything gets so slow. And you have 500 milliseconds response time, one second response time. 
And it's the worst because this is where it's most important to work fast. So sometimes, you know, with Lambda, as is, it's stateless and, and it's scaled automatically, you're not supposed to have those slowdowns with traffic spikes. So you're always 100 milliseconds plus the 20 milliseconds. So sometimes you can actually have better performances. And it can be when it matters. So you have to take that into account. Um, for HTTP, that's it. For workers, that can be interesting too, because 20 millisecond delay, uh, maybe, maybe it can be okay. What you have to consider too is that you no longer have a waiting queue, and this is huge. You put 1,000 messages in the message queue, you don't have five or 10 workers working, trying to get all those messages out of the queue. You have 1,000 workers, 1,000 lambdas, boot immediately and handle the, the, the messages. So that can be really great. You can actually have a much, much faster queue. For Chrome's batch processes, I mean, you don't care, okay? So let's get back to HTTP. With HTTP and Lambda, you have to use API Gateway. That's basically like the Nginx or Apache of Amazon. That's the server that receives the request and then calls Amazon Lambda. You have to use it, and it adds some things like, uh, some, something like uh, 15 milliseconds of network time and delay. So this is not good, again. Um, but maybe you are already using um, you know, um, PHP FPM and Nginx or Apache and then a reverse proxy or, or Varnish or a CDN or a load balancer or whatever. Maybe you already have a bit of network time. That's up to you to, to decide. But I, I share you the information and you do whatever you want with that. And finally, there, there are the cool starts. So uh, when I said that you know, there's an HTTP request, the container boots, processes the request, and stops. Well, I kind of, I lied a little bit. Um, it's not really how it goes. Amazon will keep the container live so that for the next request, it can handle it much faster. Don't have to boot again. On the first execution, this is what we call a cold start because the, the container starts from zero. And it's, it's bad, it's pretty, pretty bad, okay? Uh, let's forget the top lambda, it's really bad. Don't use those. With the one gigabyte uh, lambda, you have 200 milliseconds of delay for the first boot. So again, you have to decide if it's okay to have 200 milliseconds of delay for the first boot or not. It depends on the application. Um, what you have to consider too, again, is that you have stable response times. I think a lot about, you know, the, um, let's say you are, you are doing a sale at 8 p.m and you expect a lot of traffic, and people come on the website, and they will, most of them will have like 200 millisecond delay because they will boot 1,000 lambdas in parallel. So that's not great, but again, if the website doesn't crash, if the requests take the same time as usual plus 200 milliseconds, maybe that's worth uh, having a website that actually runs. So you have to consider it. Anyway, those performance numbers, you have to to consider them carefully because uh, you know I measure them. Um, you should measure them too. They evolve with time too. Um, Amazon does a lot of uh, improvements. Usually they start with a very restricted solution and they improve it and improve it and improve it. Um, so uh, you can expect those numbers to go down, I guess. There's also a rumor that maybe the cold start will will change a lot how they run the, the containers and so the cold start may drastically diminish, so we'll see, you know. Also, this is without any optimization. I just coded breath and it works, and I haven't taken time for now to optimize all of this. So I, I have a lot of ideas to try, and I guess we can uh, optimize that a lot. A few random things about what to expect if you want to, you know, move from classic stuff to Amazon Lambda. First of all, um, may, maybe obvious, maybe not, you do not have a database running on the Lambda. So if you have a LAMP stack, you have to take care of running the database um, separately. So you can use Amazon RDS, you can use any kind of hosted database, but you have to think about it. Um, the file system is read-only. Because you know, this is a stateless execution, you, don't, you shouldn't store anything on disk. That means that the Symfony cache and uh, you know, the compilation or the Laravel cache, you have to 
generate them before deploying. Uh, Bref helps with that, so you have a documentation, and it's even yeah, it's, it's really easy to do. Um, there are actually some edge cases uh, we are uh, currently fixing, but yeah, you have to think about that. Same for the logs. Don't write them to disk. It doesn't make any sense. What you want to do is to send them to some cloud stuff. Again, you start using a service and the serverless stuff, and you have services everywhere. Um, with Brev and Amazon Lambda, it's actually pretty easy. You just write to STD out, and it goes to our STD air, and it goes to Amazon CloudWatch. That's uh, out, of, out of the box. Uh, if you want to use ELK, if you want to use Logly or whatever, you can, obviously. Assets. Uh, if you have a website, if you, are a, if you have an API, that's really fine. If you have a website, you probably have assets like JavaScript and CSS and images. You will want to put them on a CDN, like Amazon S3 or stuff like that. You don't want to serve those assets with PHP. Um, I'm working on a tool to make that a bit easier. Uh, but honestly, it's uh, I've done. I've put my uh, blog online uh, last week with um, uh, Amazon Lambda and Bref, and I, I had to deal with assets. And I want to document also. It's it's not that hard. You just have to figure it out. And finally, you can forget about APCU because there is no shared memory, there is no APCU. So you can use any kind of cache, network cache, but not APCU. Okay, to finish, I have three case studies of applications running in production with Bref and Amazon Lambda. Uh, the first one is Return True to Win. Um, this is a really small website. Uh, it's like I like to call it a puzzle game for PHP developers. So um, basically, you go on the website and you see a piece of PHP code, and yet there are blanks, and you have to fill the blanks and try to make the function return true. And if you manage to do that, you can move to the next level. Uh, has anyone used return true to win? Yeah, quite a few. That's great. Okay. So this website runs with Amazon Lambda. Um, to explain why. I have to go back like one year ago, something, one year and a half. I wanted to do the website for a long time. I did. I play with the same thing in JavaScript. It's easy in JavaScript because it's in the client. Here, it runs on the server. So I didn't want to run some random PHP code from the internet on my server, obviously. What I started lo looking into is um, virtual machines, containers, and yeah, it can work. It's just a lot of work, and I'm lazy. And I didn't want to handle scaling and stuff, or stuff like that. And what about the costs? So I discovered Amazon Lambda. And I figured, that's perfect. I will take the code that people send me, and I will run it in a Lambda. And then that's it. At the end, everything is destroyed. Even if everything crashes, my website is separate. So no impact. So the website here runs with two Lambdas. The first one is the website that you can see. And whenever you submit, yeah, it's not really obvious, but this is a, a text box. You have to fill the code here. Uh, this is actually one and dot. You submit. It goes to the website, which put the codes together and send it to another Lambda, which is the code, uh, the Lambda that runs the code. I call that Lambda uh, eval as a service. And it runs the code, returns the results. And there you go. Well done. Move to the next step. Um, when I launched the website, okay, you can see that that's great. It, it got a bit of traffic, which is pretty great. I was really happy. People were going on the website; they were having fun, and um, yeah, quite a bit of uh, executions. On this is the first month. As a developer, this is really great because I didn't have to do anything. It was scaling automatically up and down for me, <coughs> um, and I I just had to fix the bugs in my code. Obviously, I, I, I had to do that, but I didn't have to do anything with the uh, ops side. And during the month, uh, I wondered how much this would cost me. I was getting a bit worried. And it turns out it cost me only $3 for the whole month. So I was really happy, and uh, I was relieved. And I was intrigued, because you know it just worked, and it was really cheap. So. At the same time, I was working on Pretty CI. Pretty CI is a SaaS for um, 
with continuous integration for PHP coding style. So with ProtCI, basically, it runs PHP code sniffer or CS fixer uh, in the cloud. The way it works, and when I started the project, I wrote a Laravel application. And you, know, you push your code to GitHub. GitHub, with the webhook, calls my API. I push a, a, a message in a message queue. And I have workers, you know, like five workers running in the command line. And they wait for messages. When there's a message, they process the commit. And they, said, uh, they set red or green on the, on the pull request. And that works. But I was worried, again, about scaling things up. Or uh, let's say I have 10 uh, commits pushed at the same time on different projects. And then I, I have to have a queue. And people would be waiting for the build to finish. Or I would have to scale and add new servers and new workers. And how much it would cost me? And but I thought I will use Amazon Lambda. So I moved the workers to Amazon Lambda. So you push a commit, the webhook calls my API, I push a message, and then it runs a Lambda. And the great thing is that I don't have a queue anymore. Whenever you push a commit, whenever there's a message in the message queue, the job gets done instantly. Uh, usually in less than five seconds, it's really great. Like I push a commit and the pull request, when I, I haven't even opened it, it's already red or green. This is really great in terms of user experience. And this is what I often see, like pretty CI is finished and all the other builds like Travis, they are, they are not even slow test. It's pending, pending, waiting for a container. This is so frustrating. So it works really great uh, for the users. It works really great for me, the developer. I don't have to scale anything. It just works. It just runs. I just have to make sure there's no bug. So I'm really, really happy with that. And also, I can like, anticipate costs. You see, with uh, serverless, sometimes it's really hard to know how much it will cost you. Here, it's really easy, because I know how much time a build usually takes. So I know for 100 builds or 1 million builds, I know how much it will cost me. And it's actually pretty cheap, so it, it's really great. Um, so this is pretty CI. Uh, I have a few stickers, so if at the end you want stickers, feel free to come. Um, and finally, we have Enoptea. So Enoptea is a French startup. Uh, they are in Lyon, same city as me. This is great, we talked a lot about this. And what they do basically is they process a lot of energy bills. So they have a lot of uh, background jobs. And uh, you know they are a startup. They are doing fine. They are growing every month. This is great for them. And the problem is that they starting having um, a, a larger and larger Amazon bill. So it get it get expensive, and they had to scale you know the infrastructure. So they run PHP uh, as a worker on Amazon EC2, you know classic stuff. So they had trouble scaling. I mean, they had a lot of work scaling things up. Signing a big client was a bit scary. And yeah, the Amazon bill. What they started doing in July, they started migrating from EC2 and were classic workers in PHP to Pref and Amazon Lambda. They haven't finished yet, but this is really interesting because uh, they started growing their activity and the bill grow too. And as uh, soon as they started migrating, the, the bill started to decrease. Uh, this month, it will be even lower than in September. And they expect to gain even more money when they finish migrating everything to Amazon Lambda. I cannot show you um, a whole number, but I can show you one specific microservice they migrated entirely to Amazon Lambda. They went from uh, $800 per month to $90 per month. So yeah, pretty interesting for them. Uh, they are really happy. They have less problems. They don't have to worry about scaling. They don't have to worry about signing a big client. Uh, this is uh, really great for the business. You know, this is a startup. You are growing. You pay less and less. You have a higher margin, and you are not afraid to scale anymore. This is huge value for a business. So to conclude, what should we do? Should we move everything to Amazon Lambda? Or uh, maybe the question is, is serverless mature? So the serverless technology in Amazon Lambda specifically is mature. It's been running in production for quite some time. It's been used for by very big companies, and it, it works fine. It's really stable, and it's really reliable. But the serverless ecosystem 
isn't mature. You see, we don't have the same, obviously, we don't have the same experience, we don't have the same uh, expertise and the same tools as we have today with, you know, even Docker and Kubernetes is, is more mature than that. Um, okay, but that's fine. It's not a huge problem. It's a problem we can fix. What we have to do is try and, and hack and experiment and play with all of that. We have to learn and try to uh, increase our expertise and our experience with those technologies. You can see it's really cheap, it's easy to get started. You can do that on your own project. You can do that at work, uh, maybe not on all of your application, but specific workers, Chrome, webhooks, uh, developer tools. This is really great for that because it, it allows to test in very uh, small, with a small set of features, and uh, it's fine if it fails. Okay, so I guess um, now the job is up to you. If you're interested, uh, this is on GitHub. This is open source. Feel free to contribute. And um, this is my Twitter if you have any questions. Um, thank you. Any questions? Yep. Yeah. Morning. The <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned AWS doesn't support PHP yet, and there are no Docker container, just some Linux containers. And when you use Node.js environment, I don't get where PHP interpreter comes from. I know how to deal with uh, PHP extensions. Yes. Uh, okay. What I do is I um, I have a Docker file because the uh, Linux um, version used by Amazon on Amazon Lambda, it's uh, in Docker Hub, you can install it in the Docker file. So I have a Docker, Docker file where I compile PHP, I compile all the extensions, it, it's all in the Pref uh, open source project. I compile everything, I zip it up and upload it to Amazon S3 on the public bucket. And whenever you run Pref deploy, Pref will download that archive, the, the PHP version you chose, it will download that, unzip it, and it will grab the PHP binary, the compiled bi binary, and it will grab all the extensions you want to use, and it will put that inside your Lambda. So it takes a bit of space inside your zip, right? But that's what we have to do, and then it will, it will upload all of that to Amazon Lambda. The, the day we have official support for uh, PHP on, uh, on Lambda, we can remove those binaries and just be that. I have one more question, sorry. Uh, you mentioned we cannot use APCU, but you also mentioned that when there is no cold start, so Amazon doesn't kill the container, and it means we kind of can use it, right? Because the next request it will still be filled. Yes. Um, if you have a lot of throughput, of course. The way it works is that uh, Node.js executes PHP, and the PHP process will only run for the requests and then it will stop. Node.js will still be in memory, but not PHP. That's why we have 20 milliseconds. That's the time to put PHP. Now, Thanks. people have tried uh, alternatives. That's what I want to explore, like having PHP run all the time. Uh, basically, just like Amazon does, they have a Node.js process running, and basically it stops when it waits for requests. So I, I want to try um, either PHP FPM. Some people did PHP FPM on the Lambda, so PHP FPM is up. You can use APCU. And uh, there are other alternatives, like having a socket or whatever, so we can drastically reduce the 20 milliseconds. That's why I think there are a lot of opportunities to explore. Uh, for now, I, uh, I like this solution because it's stable and it works, and we can optimize. Like Thanks. Yeah. Hello. I have a question, uh, because in the example that you provided from the Symfony that you use your Brev tool, you change the kernel of the uh, basically, the index PHP of the of the Symfony, and you pass the whole request object to to your Brev tool. And to how you did it in the development? Like you had separate file for for normal booting the kernel, or what is the best uh, tips to to for the development to to make the application? Right, that's a good question. That's uh, I should have some slides about that. Um, the development environment is a really high priority for me. Uh, right now, it works because uh, you can keep the classic index.php for Symfony and have that in an another file, um, but you don't need that. You can just run that file 
Uh, with Brev, I have a lot of tools for development environments. So you can run php-s in that file. Uh, you know, this is the built-in PHP server, and it will just work because Brev will recognize that this is a local environment. This is this, is, uh, it, it will just work and run PHP like it would with the app server run. Um, I want to look into Docker too, so that you can run in in your machine the same and exactly the same environment as the Amazon Lambda too. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, you don't have Docker, you don't have exactly the same environment, but you can do anything you can do on the Lambda. You can do web, uh, CLI stuff, and uh, workers or manual invocation. You can do all of that uh, locally. Okay, the, another question, maybe you don't know about this, but uh, do, there is some plans to, uh, by Amazon to support also the PHP to remove this bottleneck, which is the proxy between the PHP and the Amazon services? Right. I don't know if, if it's planned. Um, they recently added Go, they added Python 3 uh, not so long ago. I think they will add it eventually, at least I hope, but I don't know. Uh, what I've been told is that, unfortunately, unfortunately, inside Amazon, they don't really like PHP. Yeah. And they have a lot of misinformation inside Amazon. So uh, that's, that's too bad. I hope it will change. And I hope projects like that can show that there is a demand and there are really good use cases because you know just running Symfony and Laravel and all of that, and it's really great. So, yeah. Thank you, that's it. Any other question? Yeah. Um, Performance, um, you mentioned 25 milliseconds. Uh, I guess that's input output. Um, is that depending on the box? And another thing is SAPIs. Um, you are effectively inventing a PHP SAPI in userland. That's what the PHP SAPI does for you when you use it for web. Uh, would it make sense to make a serverless SAPI? You mean like a fast CGI or stuff like that? Or? Not, not fast CGI. When you compile PHP, you get a CLI, you get, yes, you oh. get CGI, and you get all the different entry points. You just need one that takes um, whatever comes from Lambda and populates these super globals. Right. That, that could be interesting. Yeah, right now, it doesn't populate the super globals. So you cannot run, for example, WordPress or anything that isn't object oriented. Uh, but that could be uh, something to look into. Um, yeah, and what was the first question about the performances? Yeah, it was about is it file system or is it... This is else? the whole Lambda. So Amazon has their uh, metric to measure the execution time of the Lambda from JavaScript to you know the response back. So this is the whole execution, including JavaScript and everything. Right. Hello? Uh, what about plans to support another platform, let's say Google uh, Cloud Functions? Yeah, um, Enoptea is actually, they were actually uh, looking into that to maybe use uh, Microsoft or Google Cloud. Um, it would impact the bridge between the event and the HTTP request of Symfony, for example, because it's, I expect it's not the same keys in the array, it's not the same things. So there's a bit of work. Um, and for the moment, I'm not looking, honestly, I'm not looking into that because from what I've heard, uh, Amazon Lambda is way, way more stable and more reliable than the other solutions. Um, I don't know about Google, to be honest, but I welcome any contribution and, uh, yeah. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. Oh, there's one in the back. Okay. Where? <laughs> I'm not sure if it's similar to the APCU question, but um, for example, PHP 7 and ongoing gives us a lot of optimizations for the opcodes, so they are also not cached, right? Yes, thank you for the question. That's the one I usually get to. Uh, what about opcode cache? Um, the great thing is that since which PHP version 7.2? I don't know. There you can uh, cache opcode cache in a file. 
So uh, you know in Amazon Lambda there is no memory that stays, so you cannot use indeed opcode cache uh, like this. But what I do is I configure opcode cache to save in a file. There is actually the TMP directory that is writable, so you can write in that. And um, I've done some performance tests with uh, API platform. So it runs on Symfony, and it's a demo, so it hits the database and stuff like that. And it worked really well, because uh, without opcode cache, it was like 400 milliseconds response time. And once I added it, it was something like, I don't know if it was 50 or 80 milliseconds response time. So a huge difference, and it works fine. Wh what I want to do, or at least try to do, is maybe try to generate the cache before deploying, so that even the first request is faster. And you know, uh, there are some kind of composer plugins and stuff like that that parse all the classes and pre-generate the cache and write it to disk. That's something I want to look into. Great, thanks. Okay, well, thank you.